help us. We're not expecting magic, but we need your help. All of us, each of us. And if one here needs help, particularly, severely in need of help, um, we know about it, then we're feeling something of their anguish. Uh, that, that doesn't surprise you, does it, Father? So uh, we, we trust you, however you do it, however you do it, um, we would love your help. And, and, and the request is not just a request, it's a confession that uh, ultimately there is no help but you. But we thank you that are, are, there are times when you use this one or that one of them and the other uh, for uh, your servants to be helpful. Would you enable us, give us energy, give us whatever it needs, whatever is required uh, to make ourselves available? Will you do all of that? Uh, we, we ask with confidence. We're, we're never very sure how it'll all work out, but we trust you one way or another. And we offer our thanks and make our request and our confession in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, I need to say again, this whole section that we're now in, are we doing okay? Yeah, we're we all right. Have some. This whole section, 1 Corinthians 15, 21, all the way to the end of the chapter, is a survey. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, that's good. Is a survey from the beginning to the end. 21 begins with Adam, with whom sin entered and with whom death entered. It closes with Jesus Christ, the second. I said the second, not the second. It's the last. There is no second. The Jews believe that Israel was a second Adam and said it with good reason, you understand. But it's the last Adam. And so the whole section the whole, the entire section is about two humans. One who's the father of our fleshly experience of being humans. The last Adam is the Adam who is the image in which we now by faith experience another world experience, but who ultimately will bring it all to an end and we will be re-embodied in a glorious body, a body made for, suitable for life in another world. That's what he'll say, okay? So it's two Adams. That's true in the book of Romans chapter 5, 12 and following. Yeah. And then this, and then we'll read some of the text. If Christ hasn't risen, nothing else works. Nothing. You've read this, but won't read it again. He said, but if Christ is not risen of all the humans ever, of all the humans, we are the most to be pitied. That was chapter 15 and around 18, in the rhyme there, okay? So if Christ is not risen, see all that we're doing now? Pointless, 
got no meaning, whatever, though we have been conned into believing that it's the most wondrous thing that ever happened. Need to say to anyone who was not here to hear, uh, Amy uh, fulfilled her love for the Lord Jesus Christ and her faith in him by being baptized into him. What, last Lord's Day, was it? Is that right? Well, and... Yes, brother, that's correct. All right. First Corinthians 15. I'm jumping in at verse 24, all right? I, I don't care if we went earlier, but this... Uh, I need to do this. 24. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts all end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. When the end comes, verse 24, when he has done all of this, he will deliver the dominion. Basileia means royal dominion, both Old Testament and New Testament, all right? Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom, the dominion, uh, to God the Father. The first Adam was given dominion along with Eve, Genesis 1. 26 to 28, 28, they get dominion, but it was dominion as the image of God, and they wouldn't have it. They seized that because the satanic figure in chapter 3 said he's cheating you. He knows you could be God, and they seized and grasped at God's dominion, to be either a god or a, um, uh, is Amy trying to get my attention? Yes. Uh, you she, referring to Genesis, I'm just trying to write down um, what exactly, it, where exactly in Genesis were you referring to? Okay, thank you for that. Chapters 1, 2, and 3. The last words I was just saying, the satanic figure tells them you've been cheated is chapter three. Okay, thank you, my dear. All right. He said he's cheating you. You could be a God, but you could be God or you could be his rival. And they seized for that. They grasped at that. They had dominion. They wanted more. So they weren't giving it back to God. This Adam does the very opposite. He was given dominion. How many texts can you remember or at least think about when Jesus will say, uh, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me? And you, you know how that, those texts went. And so he's got and the entire dominion, he's king of kings and lord of lords. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, uh, whom you crucified, God has made him both lord and Christ. Peter's saying in, in Genesis, uh, uh, Acts chapter 10, that Jesus Christ is lord of all. All of those texts you know, given to him, raised from the dead, and goes and is glorified. Now he exercises his reign, and he does it amid his enemies. In the psalm, God said, David said, the Lord said to my Lord, um, reign, thy, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Yes? Yes? Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Reign you in the midst of your enemies. All of this 
is the fulfillment of Old Testament promises. Okay? So, because that's true, because God said that, set my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Because that's true, Paul then says in verse 25, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. Why must he reign until he puts all enemies under his feet? Because his father said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. That's the Old Testament promise from God. It doesn't say God the Father. Well, I, I'm wanting to say something about that shortly, if I can leave it alone for a minute. It doesn't say God the Father, but we say the Father for convenience sake. Uh, the Father said to him, sit down at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. And then he tells him, they're in the midst of your enemies. This passage here says that Jesus must reign, verse 25, till he has put all enemies under his feet. What he's got, the power he has to put all enemies under his feet, is delegated authority. His father gives him the authority. This is a human. This is a human that God spoke to and give all the authority and the dominion. He didn't take it on himself. He nowhere, no, well, there's one tax, and I won't talk about it for a minute, but trust me, it makes no difference. He never resurrects himself. It's always the Father who raises him from the dead. Do you know, it's not even said that the Holy Spirit raises him from the dead. Never. It's always God, the Father, who raises him from the dead and gives him the dominion. But once he has the dominion, delegated dominion, then he exercises dominion over all his enemies. 15, 26, oh, and he must reign in 25 because the Father has given him all the authority, and he's exercising it, but he's exercising it to the glory of God, and he can't be stopped reigning, yes? Now, 26, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Sin and death, they're states, they're realities, of course, but they're not persons. Sin's not a person, death is not a person, but they are personified again and again and again in Scripture, yeah? And, and I would turn on it, it's going to take up time to do it. Just in Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to the end of the chapter, we hear that by one man, that's Adam, uh, sin enters the world. So sin passed on all men because, humanity I mean, because we've all sinned. And then it goes on to say in the same place that death reigned through sin. Yes, this is 5, 12 to 21. He says death reigned through sin. When he says death reigned, what's he calling it? When it rains, R-E-I-G-N-S, what's he making it out to be? A king. A king. He turns it into a person, a reigner, and he reigns through death. When he closes, well, 19 anyway, all the way down through 21 will do. It says that sin reigned through death. Death. Yes? So what is sin declared to be in a figure? King. Sin and death are 
kings that reign over the entire human family. They're personifying. He also says in Romans chapter 7 that there is another law, the law of sin and death. What's he saying about sin and death? In Romans chapter 7, death is a lawgiver. Sin is a lawgiver. They have a law, like God has given a law. Death has a law. Sin has a law. And he speaks about the law of sin and death. In chapter 8, he speaks, there is therefore 9 verse 1, there is therefore 9, no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. He speaks then about the law being weak, and it being taken, and then he goes on to speak in chapter 7 and 8, saying that sin took the law, which was good and righteous, and holy, and good. All those adjectives he uses in chapter 7 of Romans and in chapter 8 concerning God's law. But sin turns the law into uh, an instrument against people, okay? And he says, this happened, this happened, chapter 7, that sin might be seen to be exceedingly sinful. Sin reigns, death reigns. Sin has a law. Sin has a law. Both of those are immediately connected. We'll see down here in chapter 15. Look with me at chapter 15, please, of 1 Corinthians. Um, well, where am I? Uh, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, 50, um, I'm, I'm looking for 56, maybe. I, I'm, I'm not um, saying, oh, here it is, 56. 56. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Then we heard earlier in 21, by man came death. That's Adam, verse 22. For as in Adam all die, then in Christ all will be alive. So here, here's what we have in uh, 15, uh, 26. We have the last enemy destroyed, death. In chapter 20, of the book of Revelation, verse 14, Revelation 20, verse 14, we read that, that sin and death are cast into the lake of fire. The figure of the lake of fire is a metaphor for utter and absolute destruction. We would many of us characterize that as hell, so that if we followed Revelation 20 and verse 14, we would rightly say, sin and death, to hell with you. And it'd be a nice little way to get a real whack at it, yes? Sin and death. In the Revelation 20, the last of the enemies thrown into um, the fire. I won't do this here. We don't have the time, but uh, if, if you uh, stay, uh, you know, when we start something new, I, I'd like to read some text and we would speak at length about what I'm going to mention here. Uh, death in the Old Testament in chapter 28 of Isaiah, for example, see, here I am, I can't leave it alone. In Isaiah 28, um, Israel, Judah, Judah in particular, makes a covenant, makes a covenant with 
Assyria, the nation that is coming to destroy everything in front of them. Assyria is coming, and Assyria is the death bringer. Judah makes a covenant with Assyria, gives them all kinds of money and gold and this, that, and the other, and starts to worship their gods, that kind of thing. They made a covenant with death. And when it says a covenant with death, it means they're making a covenant with the death bringer. He goes on then to say, well, well, what they went on to do was, as well as making a covenant with the death bringer, Assyria, they make a sly covenant with Terhaka down in Egypt. And they said, okay, we've now got, what are you snickering and sneering about, uh, can it, Kevin? Yeah, all right. Here we go. <laughs> Sorry I, about that, brother. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure you are. Uh, but I, I, I didn't, I couldn't help it. He, he says, he says, death's going to end. You see this? I, I mention it because as we close this, as he closes, he says in verse fifty-four, uh, then will be brought the past the saying that's written: death is swallowed up in victory. That's from Isaiah twenty-five which is why we have to touch on it. And then he says, oh, death, where's your sting? Oh, Hades, where's your victory? That's from Hosea 13. And Babylon and Assyria are the two death bringers. Yeah. And see, here's, I, I, wish, I wish people would get this. Um, I'm not talking about you. You, you get the bulk of all of this. I'm talking about those who dabble in Scripture and then they criticize it and, and we run after them to try and uh, get it fixed and that. There's no fixing it. Our business is for people like you and me to get in and hear this thing as best we're able and speak it. And, and if people don't like it, that's, that's too bad. I just don't like it. But if we know all their arguments and follow them, that's one thing. But if we don't know the scripture, maybe we can silence them, but we're not. If we're arguing with them, we're not in the scripture and getting a sense of what the scriptures are saying. I wish, I wish I could help you and you could help me and we could help other people in the preaching that I hear would help us to get in and make this one big, massive, grand story where every time you look around, another new angle shows itself in the story. They made a covenant, Isaiah 28. They made a covenant with death. Trust me just for now. They made a covenant with death, Isaiah 28. It's with Assyria. And they were buying off death, worshiping Assyria, worshiping the military, worshiping the guys that had the power to kill you. All of that they made a covenant with. But they also made this sly arrangement where Terhaka, in addition, in case the Syria doesn't work out, we got something else. You see all of that? You see all of that? It's precisely what was done with Jesus Christ. They made a covenant with death. God in Isaiah 28 says, I'm going to annul your covenant. We'll, we'll be in one of these days if we're all alive and interested in all of that. Uh, we'll be in uh, Isaiah 28 again, so I'm not going into all the details here. But they made a covenant with death uh, so that he wouldn't get killed. That's exactly what they did. And they, uh, uh, in 229 of Acts, you men of Israel, hear those words, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man of pro 229 and following in Acts. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved by God 
by miracles and wonders and signs, which God done by him in the midst of you, whereof you are all witnesses, um, him, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you, by lawless anomia, by lawless hands, have crucified and slain. And they did it. Acts, no, no, John. John 11, 48 and following. You made a covenant with death. You got these foreigners and you had them kill him. And God annulled your covenant by raising him from the dead. In 11 of John, they came into the council, 48 and following. The, the lower guys were saying in the council, everybody's going to run after him. They'll all believe in him because he's doing all these things and saying all this stuff. And then the leading man, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, he says, you know nothing at all. You don't understand. We've got to kill him. If we don't, they will come and take away our nation. They'll, they'll destroy us. We've got to kill him. And they use the foreigners to do the job. And he didn't know it. So the text goes on to say that he was speaking the truth of God, but he didn't mean it to be the truth of God, but it was the truth of God. I'm done with him, all right? What I'm saying is that death, death is the death bringer as well as the one who brings death, you see, in all these prophetic texts. And all of those back then, God said, I will disannul, I will annul rather, your covenant with death. Isaiah 28, and then there's Isaiah 25, and then there's Hosea. All of those texts, when you hear about death and the prophets, you're hearing God speaking about a, 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 a period then when they were going through all kinds of trouble and fear and all of that and wouldn't trust him. And they made alliances with the military with the strong people around, with the politicians, with the shrewd guys, all of that to save their lives, to keep themselves alive in the flesh, to keep their country standing, that all of that, this is what is going on today and everywhere and has always had been. The Amen, rejection, brother. The, Amen. Rejection of, the, re, the rejection of God and seeking to save our lives by alliances and shrewdness and all the rest of it. Yeah. The only one who is able, thank you, baby. The only one who is capable of destroying death is the one who's already made it clear. Well, watch me. And he did it. They put him in the grind, let's say, on a Friday. Up came Sunday, and God said, okay, time to get up. And up he gets. He died 2,000 years ago. He came alive, and he hasn't been dead since. Lazarus went in the grind. He was up for we don't know how long, but he went back into the grind. Nobody did ever. What Jesus did. Never, you know, there are Old Testament Elisha raising the uh, the daughter and all of that. There are lots of those, but they all died again. Those were, uh, you know, momentary um, something or other for death. You know, well, okay, but I'll, you know, give me a couple of weeks or give me a couple of months and we're, we'll be back at it. Not with this one. This one said, I'll see you in the hell. And that 
popping, and that was the end of it. And here, and now we're back in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. Here, the enemy, though it's a force, you'll say, it's personified, somebody going against Christ. Now, he personally, he personally has defeated death, and that's that. But there's a day coming when he will obliterate the reality of dying when all become immortal who are in him by his generous and holy grace. The last enemy that will be destroyed uh, is death. So, so, and I'm not saying we can do this every moment of every day. Death is overrated with its power. That's all, that's all I'm interested in. The point I'm only interested in. My day's coming. Your day's coming. And we need, we need uh, uh, God enabling us, of course. We need to be prepared for the dying. We need to get our little children. I, I, oh, that's a risky thing that I just said there. Let me take that back. We, we shouldn't be talking about death to people who are not nearly dead. We shouldn't be making a, a, a mockish or a, no, no, no. We mustn't make it a, a biggest theme in our lives. Death is not the biggest theme. Life is the biggest theme. And it's life is how it ends. And old Jesus talks often about his death. He always says, I am going to be crucified and raised again the third day. The gospels all end with resurrection. This scopes from the first Daniel, the first Adam to the last Adam, scopes it all, begins with death and ends with immortal life, incorruptible. You're not Go and annoy yourselves when your day comes. The resurrection, we'll be all looking at one another. You get a hold of this, you know, what do you think? How does that look to you? That kind of stuff. It's going to be brilliant. It's going to be brilliant. All right, 27. For he has put all things under his feet. That's the Holy Father. We're saying the Holy Father. It's God. But we'll send the Holy Father uh, for convenience sake. But when he says, all things are put under him. Now, there is an allusion to the psalmist. That's also in, uh, in Genesis chapter 1, um, 26 to 28, where God gives the humans dominion. It's delegated dominion that he gives them. It's not his dominion. He doesn't stop being uh, Lord God and King and all the rest of it. He gives them, Adam and Eve, this delegated dominion. He gives the, he gives the second, the last, Adam. He gives him dominion also, but it's delegated. God does not cease to be the supreme one. This man that God is being, he is given all of this dominion. He's a human who was given the dominion. Now, that human is God being a dominion, but he is God being a dominion. He is God giving him, I'm losing my mind here. I'm not joking either. Uh, it's God giving him, it's God giving him dominion. He doesn't take it. This is a man, everything that Jesus did, what to say, what to do, when to do it, all of that, he was empowered by God. You've heard about this, he says, beginning with John the Baptist, how Jesus of Nazareth, a man anointed by the Spirit of God, and God, he went about healing all that were oppressed of the devil, healing people, disease, right, left, and center, and all of that he did because God was with him. Chapter 10 in the book of Acts. This is all delegated authority. Remember, we're talking about a glorified human here. Yes? 
We're talking about a glorified, resurrected, glorified human. He hasn't ceased being a human here. Yeah. He said, um, as by man came death, 21, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. He's a man. He's a glorified man, but he's a man. And then what? What does this man with all his authority do? Uh, when the end comes, where am I? Uh, he put all things under his feet. But when he says all things, verse 27, are put under him, it's evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Why would he say such a thing? Who would have thought that God, uh, you know, has all this power and all the rest of it, that he would not be accepted? What happens when Jesus, when God becomes Jesus Christ and God, let's say the Father, just keep it clear. God the Father wants him to be number one. God is sustaining him, but it's Jesus everybody sees. It's Jesus that everybody struggles with. It's Jesus that the Holy Spirit talks about. 1613 of John, the Spirit of truth, he will come and he will do this, that, and the other. He will not speak of his own authority. But whatever things he hear, that shall he speak. And he will take of mine and declare it unto you. <clears throat> it's a human that gets this authority, and that becomes important for you and me. His resurrection is not just for himself. There was dominion given to us back when God said, I want human beings. I want them to be my companions. I want them to live with me, of course, in my image. We screwed it up. And the good news was he made us mortal. Now, he did us a favor. And so he made us mortal. And then we died. But the psalmist in chapter 8 said, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you visit him. That is, you pay attention to him and go to be with him. Like visit the widows and that you remember. He said, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you visit him? You made him a little lower than the angels. Then you crowned him with glory and honor. You give him dominion over all the works of your hands. But listen to the Hebrew writer. Hebrew writer in chapter 2, verse 5. You can turn if you wish, but I'm, I'm reading it so you'll know it's there, all right? He says, the Hebrew writer in 2, verse 5. For he has not put the world to come of which we speak in subjection to angels. But one testified in a certain place as if he didn't know. One testified in a certain place, that's two six. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you take care of him? Not a bad paraphrase. You have made him a little lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. You set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. He's quoting Psalm 8. Psalm 8 looks back to Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 28, where, the, where God says that to them. Now he says in 2, verse 8b, For in that he put all in subjection under his feet. He left nothing that is not put under his feet. But now 
Hmm. Hmm. Isn't it great? Okay. But now he said, we do not yet see all things put under him. He said that to man. He gave him all the dominion. He said, but we've never seen that. God spoke it in Genesis. We did what we did. And we lost. Uh, we fell from the glory of God. The psalmist takes him seriously in Genesis chapter 1. But the Hebrew writer says, all of that, we haven't seen that yet. 2.8, for we have not yet seen it. And then the good news, verse 9, but we see Jesus. Yeah, well, you know, good for Jesus. If, if, if somebody should make it, it should have been Jesus. He was such a good guy and all of those other things. But it's not just about Jesus. It's Jesus, the man who is the son of man that the psalmist speaks about. He is the true image of God that we, right at the beginning, we were the image of God. But it, it was all all looking forward to how God would work out what he worked out. We don't see, we don't see all the cartels shut down. We don't see, see all the people sellers. We don't see all the plundering, raping. I was going to say a bad word there. Can you believe that? We can't see uh, all of those people put down. Fine, okay. Bless me. We can see all of that happening, but we see Jesus. And it's not only that Jesus is exalted, it's who it is that's exalted. It's a human who represents humans, who stands for us who came and became one of us. John 1, verse 14. He wasn't just raised and given glory for himself, but he was given glory for himself because it's, he was glorious and God acknowledged. One day, God was looking around for someone who knew what to do with stuff. And he gave Jesus power over bread. And what did he do? He went around healing everybody right, left, and sent. He gave him power over leprosy. And he went around kissing lepers and, and healing everybody in sight. He gave him power over everything. And God said, finally, here's a man who knows what to do with power. And he gave him it all. All authority has been given to me. And he gave him authority, personally mean, gave him authority over death. And he went looking for death. Satan came to him in the wilderness. A fella said, I can't help thinking if the devil could have gotten out of that meeting, he would have. He wasn't meeting Adam and Eve there. He was now meeting the son of man. But he was a man. And for humans, he said no to that rascal. It was for humans. He ran to die, not masochistic, but to show us what Life in the flesh is in the end. It's to be ended. Enjoy it while you've got it. I want you to. But quit clinging on to it the way Mary is clinging on to. The fleshly Jesus, she thinks. She thinks it's back business as usual. And he tells her, don't do that. It's not business as usual, I'm ascending to my father. Glorification. He's bringing an end to his own relationship 
the flesh, life in the flesh. And he says that to John. John, that's your mother. Mother, that's your son. All of that says bye to flesh. The Father loves me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. Not in flesh, but in spirit. 1 Peter 3, 18. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 4. He is now a live. A is not good enough, but I'm using it so I can get the phrase. He is now a life giving spirit. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, he is life giving spirit. He's not flesh the way you and I are anymore. He is a human. He's Jesus Christ, the one we know. When he goes to Thomas on that night, he says to him, check me out. He sees the wounds there. The wounds are the proof of authenticity, identification. I'm not somebody standing in for the Nazareth fellow. I'm not some guy I look alike. No, I'm me. Look at that. And he shows the wounds. Yeah, those are the proofs, the identification proofs. But the wounds, the lethal wounds were not on a corpse. They were on a living, young prince. Yeah. So when he wins, we win. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, we, we, read, we, we read all those other verses. Let me jump down. We, we, yeah, we, we, we're definitely done. Let, verse 15. Jim, do you want to leave it there? Brother, for next week, because you've got 45. Yeah, right. why don't you pick it up next Thank week you. from there?